2020. What a garbage fire of a year, huh? But for all the horrible real-world stuff that had us staying inside for the majority of the year, at least we had some banger games to distract us. Now that the new year is on the horizon, it's time to count down the best of those games, as well as a few special mentions. As always, this is my list, and so it's going to reflect my tastes, as well as, you know, the games that I actually played this year. If you disagree with any of these entries, or think I've ignored a game that should have gotten some recognition, please let me know in the comments below. Now let's kick this off with our first special mention. 2020's best multiplayer, Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout. When it was first revealed around last year's E3, I knew that Mediatonic's platformer Battle Royale Hybrid was going to be a smash hit, and boy was I right. With its blend of game show obstacle courses and simple, intuitive mechanics, Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout feels like an absolute no-brainer, and yet it stands out alongside other mass multiplayer elimination games because there's really nothing else like it. On top of that mechanical and conceptual simplicity, the game does a fantastic job of keeping players hooked by keeping levels and the wait times between new games relatively short, which made it perfect for those moments where you only had a few spare minutes to squeeze in a game. This is to say nothing of its delightfully vibrant visual style or the fact that the game continues to grow with more modes and costumes as time goes on. Honestly, if it weren't for the inclusion of microtransactions in this paid game, Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout might have earned itself a place on my actual Game of the Year list. It's that good. Number 10. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 After the abysmal display that was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5, I wasn't sure we'd ever get another great game out of this legendary skateboarding franchise. But then along came Vicarious Visions to recreate the first two classics from the ground up, all while maintaining the crisp score attack mechanics and carefree attitude that made the originals so popular. While tricking all over levels from my youth with songs from Goldfinger and Rage Against the Machine transported me back to the 90s, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 is more than just a modern coat of paint over a couple of two decade old games, even if those old games have aged incredibly well on a mechanical level. The game features brand new skaters, a soundtrack with fresh tracks alongside beloved classics, and it even implements a variety of tricks from later games in the series, including reverts and manuals. There's also a surprising amount of stuff to do, with the original game's laundry list of challenges growing further to account for the expanded trick list, as well as each skater getting their own range of challenges to complete. The game isn't perfect, as it lacks a lot of the weirdest stuff that I loved about those early Tony Hawk games, but Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 is a fantastic return to form for the series as a whole, and might just be the most fun I've ever had with a skateboarding game. Number 9. Bug Snacks. When Bug Snacks debuted alongside the new Ratchet and Clank, Spider Man Miles Morales, and Demon's Souls during Sony's June PS5 event, something about it caught the attention of the internet. Whether it was for the memes or for that catchy as hell theme song, this indie game somehow stood out alongside bigger, shinier announcements, and it did not disappoint on release. Now, I'm not here to argue that Bug Snacks is some incredible gameplay experience because, mechanically speaking, it's very basic but it is an incredibly compelling story. Its bright and colorful visual style belies this surprisingly mature writing that deals with a cast of deeply flawed characters. But then there's also the creeping horror of the overarching plot. Snacktooth Island, the game's main setting, is this mysterious, uncharted location overrun by adorable food-based animals that mutate the limbs of anyone who eats them, and those people are compelled to eat as many of them as they can. Even discounting the body horror element, there's a sinister undertone to it all, which is just fascinating to me. And yeah, the actual gameplay of documenting and catching the titular bug snacks is a little bit light, but it can afford to be. It's still fun and serves as a vehicle for this really unique plot, which is one that I highly recommend experiencing if you have the chance. What discovery could tempt us to start a new life in the untamed wild? Bug snacks. 2020's best piece of music. Bury the Light, Devil May Cry 5 Special Edition. Man, remember how good Devil May Cry 5's soundtrack was? If you don't, then I'm here to remind you that DMC 5's soundtrack kicked all of the ass. But that released last year, so it has no place on this list. Thankfully, Devil May Cry 5 Special Edition came out, and with a new playable character in the form of series mainstay Virgil, there was a need for a brand new character-specific battle theme, and Casey Edwards knocked it out of the park again. There's just so much to love about the track, from Victor Borba's powerful vocals to the way that the final chorus utilizes a similar melody to the second part of Devil Trigger's chorus. And that solo? Mwah! Beautiful. 
Legit, the only reason I've considered even touching DMC5 Special Edition is to experience this song being filtered in dynamically as I perform better in combat. Is that worth purchasing an entire game that I've already experienced the majority of? Maybe. Number 8. Ori and the Will of the Wisps I think Ori and the Will of the Wisps was one of my first big surprises of the year. That's not to say that I wasn't expecting great things from the sequel to Ori and the Blind Forest, because I was. It's more that, in addition to the top-notch Metroidvania gameplay and gorgeous visuals that I was expecting, the game introduced expanded combat mechanics and a story that somehow managed to one-up the heart-wrenching plot of the original. I adored the first Ori game for its fluid platforming and ever-expanding list of traversal techniques, and these elements return in full force for Will of the Wisps, but having actual melee attacks that you can customize and that feel heavy and impactful is a vast improvement. It also allows for the inclusion of exciting boss battles which help the game feel a little better paced. Meanwhile, the Ori games continue to do a great job of non-verbal storytelling. Thanks to its moving score and emotive animations, the story of Ori and Ku, Ori's baby owl companion, being separated in an unfamiliar land manages to be a real tearjerker, often entirely without words. And it would be crazy of me not to reiterate that this game looks breathtaking. Just look at it. Even without its smooth platforming, deeper combat, or emotional story, those visuals are Game of the Year material on their own. And this is made in Unity! UNITY! Number 7. Spider-Man Miles Morales It's no secret that I was blown away by 2018's Spider-Man for PS4. The intuitive and satisfying web swinging, the combat that was straightforward but allowed for a lot of experimentation, the story that was familiar yet surprising in a lot of ways, I loved almost everything about that game. Spider-Man Miles Morales is all of the stuff I loved about the game but more. Web swinging has made that little bit more satisfying thanks to stylish new animations. Combat benefits from the inclusion of new gadgets and venom powers, meaning you have more abilities to experiment with. And the story, once again, deals with a lot of familiar elements, but its smaller, more intimate scale helps it to hit home just that little bit harder. Honestly, I think I enjoyed Spider-Man Miles Morales just a tiny bit more than the original, even if you could simply call it more of the same. The key here is that it trims the stuff that didn't really work that well in the original, like the forced linear stealth sections, while also making the aforementioned changes and additions to the elements that did. And all of this without mentioning that the game is a fantastic launch title for the next generation of PlayStation, demonstrating visual fidelity and frankly insane loading speeds that I'd never thought I'd see on a console. I feel like it's safe to say that Spider-Man Miles Morales may just be the new gold standard for superhero games. Twenty twenty's best surprise, Astro's Playroom. When was the last time you bought a new console and found that not only was there a game pre-installed on it, but that this free packing game was surprisingly good? Prior to this year, the only game that comes to mind is Alex Kidd in Miracle World for the Sega Master System 2, but it's time for that big ear loser to move aside, because Astro's Playroom is kind of incredible. Mechanically, Astro's Playroom is a competent, if simple, platformer, but it serves a greater purpose as a tech demo for the PS5's DualSense controller. While experiencing the controller's functions for the first time was a cool surprise in its own right, doing so in these levels that are decked out in PlayStation easter eggs and nods to the brand's history fed the nostalgia center of my brain for days. If you happen to be one of the lucky few who managed to grab a PS5 this year, don't sleep on Astro's Playroom. It may be free and also a tech demo, but it's clear that some serious time and care has gone into it. Number 6. Demon's Souls Demon's Souls is everything I want in a remake for better or for worse. I feel like most remakes feature input from teams or individuals that worked on the original, and while they did receive Miyazaki's blessing before beginning the project, Bluepoint's Demon's Souls is exactly that. Bluepoints. As such, we get to see how the land and enemies of Boletaria look through fresh eyes. Every moment has the opportunity to feel different depending on how this new team of developers interpreted the original, and whether you prefer the original or the remake, it does feel tangibly different. There's something more traditionally heroic about Bluepoint's Demon Souls than From Software's, and while I can't help but miss the uncanny, alien tone of the 2009 original, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't blown away by the sheer quality of the new visuals and audio. 
So much effort has gone into transforming this PS3 cult hit into the jewel of the PS5's launch lineup, and it shows through the game's minute attention to detail and super impactful animations. It's almost more impressive than that much of Demon Souls' genre-defining gameplay remains untouched aside from a handful of quality of life changes. I think it's pretty fair to say that while Demon's Souls for PS5 can never truly replace the original, it's a reimagining that I'm really glad exists, and I'm excited for a whole new generation of players to experience the seminal Souls game. I shall guide you to the fissure. So that you may lull the old one back to slumber. Number 5. Streets of Rage 4 There's something really satisfying about seeing a game from a long dormant franchise in a genre whose heyday has long since passed not only release but exceed all expectations, and Streets of Rage 4 might just be the best example of that in recent memory. New beat-em-ups are few and far between, and the last Streets of Rage game came out 26 years ago, so you could be forgiven for not expecting a lot, but the trio of Dot Emu, Lizard Cube, and Guard Crush games have delivered what I would call a beat-em-up masterpiece. On top of adding a combo system that allows for juggles between walls and players, Streets of Rage 4 also introduces a Bloodborne-esque rally system that encourages you to get back on the offense to regain lost health after taking a hit. Then there's the roster of playable characters which features returning Streets of Rage favorites as well as brand new fighters, each of which have their own distinct strengths and weaknesses and are a joy to play as. To wrap up the wall-to-wall -wall action, Streets of Rage 4 is just dripping with style from its bold, hand-drawn character art and vividly colored environments to its classic pickup sound effects and incredibly groovy soundtrack. And all of that is without mentioning the more nostalgic elements like environments and fighters, which you can unlock no less, ripped straight from the original games. I'm not the biggest beat-em-up fan in the world, but I know what I like, and Streets of Rage 4 is absolutely brilliant. Twenty twenty's best of the backlog, Hades. So, the way that I play games with regards to this channel and reviews means that I don't get to play everything. I do try though, which means I often get stuck into games that I don't get a chance to finish. Hades is one such game, and despite only being able to sink a handful of hours into it, everything about it screams Game of the Year contender. Its striking hand-drawn interpretations of the Greek pantheon are what immediately drew me in, and I've had a ton of fun with the game's combat, as well as its boon system, wherein gods offer you run-based perks that you can mix and match. As far as roguelikes go, it seems pretty solid. But then there's the game's interesting story and likable cast of characters, and how dying, a common occurrence, actually progresses the plot or your relationship with other characters. I think this might be the only roguelike I've played that makes dying feel good, which is a neat concept. So here's to you, Hades, the best game I wish I played more of this year. Number 4. Doom Eternal Back in 2016, I named Doom as my game of the year, and while I've since reconsidered that to some degree, I still maintain that it's a masterclass in high-speed shooter action with some supremely enjoyable and over-the-top visuals and audio to bring it all together. Doom Eternal provides a lot of the same, but rather than resting on 2016's laurels, it pushes players to learn and improve instead of falling into a comfortable rut, resulting in a more gratifying experience overall. Where Doom 2016 gave you an arsenal of diabolical weapons that felt effective in every situation, Doom Eternal gives enemies weaknesses which, in turn, gives every weapon in your arsenal a reason to exist. They aren't just different flavors of murder, they're murder keys for fleshy, bloody locks. You could just break those locks through sheer attrition, sure, but mastering this combat and finding the right keys for the right locks is a whole new level of satisfaction. Beyond this admittedly large shift in game design, Doom Eternal feels like someone found the heavy metal dial that Doom 2016 turned up to 11 and just broke the damn thing off. Mick Gordon's soundtrack manages to live up to the high watermark achieved by his work in 2016, and the game's visuals are simply jaw-dropping, whether we're talking about the various heavy metal album covers that make up the game's levels, or the damage system that melts demon flesh from the bone, making gunplay that much more satisfying. Doom Eternal is just about everything I could want in a Doom sequel. Number 3. The Last of Us Part 2 I'll be the first to admit that The Last of Us probably didn't need a sequel, but even so, I think the team at Naughty Dog managed to make a worthy successor to what many still consider to be one of the best narratives in video games. 
On that front, The Last of Us Part 2 offers up a grim tale of revenge and perspective that is both gripping and incredibly exhausting, as it rarely lets up on the crushing despair for more than a moment, often doing so only to remind you of just how awful things have gotten. It's not necessarily a crowd pleaser, but although I have a few nitpicks about pacing, I ultimately think the story being told is handled well enough, but it's hammered home by superb performances from Laura Bailey and Ashley Johnson. Where The Last of Us Part 2 succeeds most, however, is in its polished gameplay. Not only are the shooting mechanics a touch more responsive than in the original, there are also more movement options available to you, such as crawling and sliding through gaps. These additions, while seemingly small, make sneaking and fighting your way through these incredibly detailed areas really dynamic, something that's helped along by refined enemy AI and a handful of new enemy types to keep you on your toes. The game is also full of accessibility options, making it one of the most user-friendly experiences in the AAA gaming scene. Now all we need is for Naughty Dog to treat its developers with the respect and care they deserve, and we'll be golden. How many came with you? Hmm? Just you two? You can't stop this. 2020's best escape, Animal Crossing New Horizons. Video games often serve as a fantastic escape from our everyday lives, but never has that been more important than this year, where most of us were stuck inside, unable to travel or catch up with friends and family. So it was some small mercy then that Animal Crossing New Horizons came out this year, providing a wholesome distraction from the world outside. Its premise, which had you beginning a new life and founding a town on a tropical island, catered perfectly to that desire to just get away from the world. And the ability to travel to your friends' towns and work with them in completing your various collections was the heartwarming social angle that I was really looking for at the time. Months after release, I've since moved on from Animal Crossing, and sure, the game has plenty of flaws to pick on, but I think more than any other game this year, New Horizons made missing my friends and putting any plans I had on hold that much more bearable. Thank you for taking my money, Tom Nook. Number 2. Ghost of Tsushima in recent years, I found myself falling out of love with open world games. Sure, they're bigger and more beautifully realized than ever before, but so often those expansive maps are home to tiresome, meaningless filler. So imagine my surprise then when Ghost of Tsushima delivered a world where not only was the area more densely packed, but everything within that area felt rewarding to engage with. Testing your slicing skills, composing haiku, even taking a bath. Everything you do outside of Ghost of Tsushima's main story rewards you with upgrades and cosmetics, as well as extra bits of story. And finding these experiences out in the world is a joy thanks to the game's environmental design. Wandering the island of Tsushima and following smoke plumes or birds to points of interest feels really natural. And even when you want to go somewhere specific, Ghost's use of the wind as a waypoint to keep you immersed in the world is a stroke of pure genius. Then there's Ghost of Tsushima's story, a tragedy of honor and tradition versus survival, which I found really compelling once it hit its stride. This riveting drama is backed up by fun and varied freeform combat and malleable, satisfying stealth, allowing you to play as an unstoppable samurai or silent ninja respectively. Also, the game is just really stylish, with its striking samurai cinema framing, vibrant environments, and that eye-catching monochromatic ghost stance. The PS4 could not ask for a better send-off than Ghost of Tsushima. Number 1. Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time It's a real power move to simply release a numbered sequel to a long-dead franchise that disregards the existence of four other games entirely, but that's what Toys for Bob did with Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time this year. Not only that, but the game was excellent. With super responsive controls, Crash 4's precision platforming feels tighter than ever, which honestly would have been enough for me. But in addition to classic platforming action and the occasional auto-scroll or vehicle section, the game introduces a bunch of new mechanics to keep things exciting. For starters, you have the new Quantum Masks, which introduce hazards that phase in and out of existence, challenges that require you to reverse gravity and platform on the ceiling, and even sequences that require you to slow the speed of time to safely traverse. Then there are the new playable characters, Torna, Dingo Dial, and Cortex, who each come equipped with different gear and abilities to spice things up, and in some cases, change the pace of the game entirely. All of these new elements support a story that feels perfectly in line with classic Crash. It's funny, it makes great use of the series' quirky characters, and it even throws in a few surprises for good measure. 
Add to that some superb animations, a soundtrack that feels distinctly Crash Bandicoot despite changing to fit the game's variety of colourful levels, and a ton of rewarding content to tackle, and Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is more than I could have ever asked for from a Crash sequel in 2020. It's insane. Quickly, we must go! Crash! 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 Yeah, good. You know, every year I'm surprised by the number of amazing games that came out, and it often feels like on any other day, the game of the year could have been any one of the top three or four on my list. This year though, I feel like I could name any of the top six or seven as game of the year without a second thought. For all the crap that came out of 2020, we really did have some fantastic games to pass the time with, and I hope you all found some awesome stuff to play, whether it was new or old, or whether it appeared in my game of the year list or not. And if your favourite game of the year didn't make the cut here, let me know what it was and why it was your game of the year in the comments below. Thank you all so much for joining me for this look back at the best of what 2020 had to offer, and I will see you next year where hopefully things are just a little bit brighter.